sitting on my doorstep The people's passing by They're coming back from getting wrecked Everybody's high Saturday night, what a bitch Laying on the lawn The morning comes to bring the switch After the buzz is gone Hello and welcome to another episode of Addictions, the podcast about addictions. I'm your host, David Wagner. On this episode, we are going to be continuing our month-long series on the negative stigmas surrounding the world of addiction. We are going to be speaking with two guests on today's show. Our first guest is a lifelong friend of mine and actually recovering from addiction as well. Well, our second guest, Daniel Snyder, has around 15 years of clean time, and he's actually now a major advocate for ending the climate of negative stigma in regard to addiction. Before we speak with our first guest, I want to remind everyone that you can find links to listen to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, and Stitcher on our website at www.addictionspodcast.com. We also have all sorts of extra content and stuff on the website, including links to listen to every episode of the show and links and resources for getting help with addiction. And I try to update that website as often as I can with new videos and stuff like that as well. And if you're interested in becoming a supporter of the show, we have links to donate to the podcast via Patreon or PayPal to help me keep the lights on here in the studio. So be sure to check that out. Again, it's www.addictionspodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash addictionspodcast. And on Twitter, our handle is at AddictionsCast. With that out of the way, let's get down to business. Like I mentioned earlier, my first guest is a very good friend of mine and was actually my partner in crime for quite a few years, Sarah Sui. Like me, Sarah has truly experienced the absolute hell that addiction can bring, and she makes some very good points in this conversation that we have. So let's give it a listen. Okay, so continuing on with our episodes about stigma, today I'm going to be speaking with a friend of mine. Her name's Sarah. She's been on the show before, and she's also a recovering addict as well. But today, her and I are going to be chatting a little bit about the negative stigma surrounding addiction. And if you missed our our last episode where we kind of introduced the idea of what negative stigma actually is and just the basics of that sort of thing... Uh, I urge you to go back and, and listen to that episode first because it's going to kind of all, of... all of these episodes this month are going to be focused on stigma and what we can do to reduce the negative stigma or at least address it in some way. In your experience, Sarah, would you say that you've witnessed that sort of neg- negative stigma stigma towards people with addiction problems? Oh, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, living in the area that we live in, a smaller town and not so progressive, I suppose, is a nice way to put it. Um, I feel I've encountered it myself as well as seen it in media, comments on media things, um, and then even in my own life. I mean, being a mom, I've encountered a few situations. Obviously, in a small town, people know um, things and don't have to be directly related to you. And having it affect who um, is allowed, you know, to be around myself or my little girl or come over to play or... Yeah, word travels fast in a small town. It, it really does. <laughs> it's... it's. I know this, but it's it's been... Uh, amazed me a few times I suppose sometimes people I've never even heard of know more about my past than I do I guess <laughs> but... no there's some some terms like like the word junkie that to me is is like it's equivalent to almost like a racial slur in my in my opinion calling someone a junkie you know it, it seems derogatory to me and, and, and a lot of people agree with that but I'm kind of wondering what you think about that I guess it would depend on where it's coming from, how it's being said. Yeah, I mean, there's better words that you could say, definitely. And and then it could definitely be an 
discouraging factor and the stigma. You know, I've referred to myself as that before. Yeah. I mean, I've been to meetings and in um, counseling where they refer to it people as junkies or themselves as junkies um, or past junkies and stuff. There's definitely a harsh ring to it. Like, but I guess it just, in my opinion, depends on. Kind of depends on who you are. Where how it's being thrown out there, definitely. Um, what about the word addict? I mean, there's. I've encountered some people. I've actually been speaking with another guy who I'm going to be having on the show to talk about this sort of thing. But he would even go as far as saying, and I, a lot of professionals even say this too, that the word addict, you know, perpetuates the negative stigma. But I would say to that, well, you know, people with diabetes. They're called diabetics. Mm -hmm. People with addiction problem, addicts. I don't really see the problem in in using that word. Yeah, I, I, me neither either, being where I am now. But I can definitely say before I got into this situation, when I had a perspective that was unexperienced in addiction and um, all this, that... When I first had to start, you know, when you start going to meetings and stuff, you have to stand up and introduce yourself and proclaim that you're an addict. That was hard for me for some reason. Yeah. You know, it really was not just because to admit, oh, this is where I've been and what I've done. I've never, you know, but that word. Yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, that word, too, it does carry somewhat of a. Yeah, that that stigma that like yeah. once you say that there's there's you're going to be seen a just a certain way yeah um, I, I i can i can agree with that people not really understanding the complicatedness of addiction and and that maybe you can fall into it accidentally or, yeah there's so many ways to fall into once it. you go in it's a not as easy as you think to get out as just mind over matter or don't you know just stop and um, it's, it's not always that easy no, no no and so you know for example my family I, when i confessed hey I'm an addict. I'm trying to recover. I can still see to this day the um, change. Yes, and how I'm treated, and my opinion, and how it's taken, and the weight it has anymore. And then too, kind of feel like I'm treated like that special child. I guess you know, like yeah. oh, be careful. You know, don't. Mm, she's an addict. You know, or I. I so I, I can understand. Maybe um, people not liking the word because of the what's what society has put in it. Not necessarily exactly. what it means, but how it's been used, I guess. Yeah, I, so. I agree. I mean, but it's hard to, you know, it's hard to do a, a show about addiction like I'm doing without using the, some of these words. Oh, yeah. And I, I'm not trying to use these words in a derogatory Absolutely. manner. Uh, I do avoid the, the word junkie. Personally, because I feel that that word is one of the worst. It's, you know, it seems like almost like an insult so, to me. So, I mean, I'm just curious, what what would this guy have? Um, what's an alternative? That's to that's what we were going to be talking about. A uh, person with substance abuse disorder could be one way of looking at it. Right. But then, but then there are people that have addictions that aren't. They don't have anything to do with any sort of substance. substance. They're addicted to gambling, or they're addicted to you know, shopping, whatever, yeah. shopping, spending money. Working. Uh, so what, what would we do there? What would we label those people? You right, know? yeah. It's... So it's, there's a really kind of a gray area there. And I, 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 I want to be, you know, quote unquote, politically correct. And I don't want to offend anybody, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, we do need to explore that, explore that aspect of the negative stigma part. But there's there's other things I wanted to kind of pick your brain about as okay. far as the stigma goes. In clinical settings, like in doctor's offices, um, have you ever, you know, noticed any sort of stigma coming from professionals, pro healthcare professionals? Yes. Oh, yes. Um. <laughs> like a, ex in an extreme way or a subtle um, way? Well... Here's an example. Um, my family doctor, the doctor I go to see for checkups and and just, you know, whatever, normal stuff. Um, 
after I had um, started recovering and, and I was getting all my medical issues with addiction anyways taken care of elsewhere, um, I, I thought that I had stomach issues. I thought that my, Maybe did some damage. It, right. To my stomach or potentially the liver or what whatnot. I was having some um, health issues with getting sick and, and pain and stuff like that. Well, so I go to see my doctor and I express this to him. And um, that's not even at yeah, all what I was not, saying but... or asking for or trying to get. I exactly. S- I simply expressed that I was addicted to these. I think in the consumption of so much and over so many years, I may have done something to my stomach. Can you look at it for me? But his automatic response was, so this is a person looking for drugs. Yep, and I'm not giving you pills. Yeah, I, I've actually seen that too in my situation, you know. So the first thing I usually do when I go see a new doctor is say, look, I, I am a recovering addict. And I mean, there's that word again, you know, I don't know what yeah. else to say. Yeah. Um, I have substance abuse disorder. I'm not here for drugs, I'm here for help. But that's kind of mainly what I wanted to speak to you about was those two things, the the wording about stigma and the, uh, you know, whether you've witnessed it in a professional setting or not. I think, um, too, it probably depends where you're located. I'm, I mean, oh, definitely. unfortunately, I mean, it, it's true. Some places are just more progressive than others. And in the place where, where I am, I've grown up, I was born and grow, grew, grew up here. I've, I've learned... This is just how I, I take it and choose to carry it is that I I keep it to myself unless it's someone I trust or, you know, obviously a professional yeah. or medical um, setting where I'm addressing the issue and it's something that needs to be shared. Otherwise, I keep it to myself because it's, of yeah. the stigma and because, you know, um, the judgment and, and the... Well, it carries the assumptions you, that go with it. Um, yeah, you you carry a. It's almost like a shameful uh, thing to admit. You absolutely. know, I, and I, and I feel that. Well, and some people just don't understand and just assume that. Hey, she she's a, a recovering addict. She made bad choices, so she cannot be trusted. I don't want my children there. I don't want this there. Or, you know, I yeah. fear. I would love to do a daycare or or. Um, you know, I just, I, 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 I definitely fear that people won't, wouldn't trust me with their children or animals or, um, with anything Even though in this area. Even though, and I can personally vouch for this, Sarah, you are great with children, you know, and I love, uh, kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love watching their little minds grow and it's, it's amazing, you know, and we're not bad people. And most, no. most people who have had these issues deep down. They are not bad people, you know. I yeah, I have stolen. I have done some stupid shit, yeah. you know. But I, I, deep down, you and I, and most the vast majority of people out there that went through substance abuse issues or whatever addiction issues, they aren't monsters, you know. We're not evil. We're not bad people. Well, and any mistake you think about it is not just. I mean, there's a level oh, of yeah. humility it takes to to consider that. People make mistakes. Definitely, it's not really the mistakes that you make so much. I mean, you know that matter. It's 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 how you go about things after that mistake, making it right, bettering yourself, not making that mistake again. And I mean, so could, when it comes down to it, there's there's that um, psychological and cognitive issue there too. That the mentality. I mean, again, here in this area, seems to be. Um, not compassionate and to, not to even all. that, let alone addiction. See, and that's, that's what we need to fight this addiction thing yes. is understanding and compassion from not just the healthcare professionals, but society in general, Critical because thing. this is a healthcare issue, not a criminal issue. Yeah. It can get into the criminal side of things when you Most start times. stealing shit mm-hmm. to pay for your drugs or whatever, but you know the underlying root issue is a healthcare issue period you know that is a fact and i think that it has been kind of you know the the negative stigma has been kind of waning or slowing down yeah. to a degree with all the the new awareness oh, with gosh. the opioid well, epidemic think about from when we first got into this world to now yeah. i mean even when we first started seeking help to now exactly um i mean it's it's 
it's mind blowing the how much more resources there are. Yeah, and that's great. That's great. You know, my only hope is that eventually society as a whole will just kind of really realize that, you know, we shouldn't be insulting these people or oppressing them or holding them down because of this issue that they have. And so that's why this this whole month I'm doing episodes on the negative stigma and trying to talk to people about it. I am going to thank you for giving us your time to come on the Addictions Podcast. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Again, I want to thank Sarah for being on the show and sharing some of her experiences and thoughts on this sort of negative stigma thing. Now, our next guest, Daniel Snyder, I actually met on Twitter. He's actually a fan of the show and sent me a message talking about how certain language we use can actually serve to perpetuate this negative stigma, even when we don't necessarily intend our words to have that effect. Now, Daniel has dealt with heroin addiction in the past, and since then, he has actually become a major advocate for the dismantling of the negative stigma in relation to addiction and substance abuse disorders. Daniel is very active on Twitter, and I highly recommend following him on Twitter. His handle is at Daniel Snyder one That's D-A-N-I-E-L-S-N-Y-D-E-R-1. He posts some very insightful stuff, and Daniel is also a big part of the website www.mindfulhope.com, which is an absolutely fantastic website that posts all sorts of articles about just encouraging hope through the sharing of various stories and things like that. So be sure to check that out. I'll put a link up on our Facebook page and our website. Daniel and I discuss a variety of addiction-related topics, but we really focus on the language that we often use that perpetuates the negative stigma. So here we go. Let's give that conversation a listen. All right, today on the show we are speaking with a really special guest, uh, Daniel Snyder. And I, I wanted to have Daniel on the show because he actually got a hold of me and pointed out some things that I really didn't think of uh, when we were talking about the word stigma in regard to addiction. You know, sometimes even even using the word addict can be a stigmatizing term to a degree. I, I, I kind of think it it will depend on the context in which you use that word, but there was one tweet, Daniel, that I noticed that you put out just, I don't know, a few days ago, but it it really made a lot of sense to me, and if I can find it here, let's see. It was it was something along the lines of how, you know, there's not a one-size-fits-all kind of solution. You know, we can't, with a broad policy, you're not going to solve this addiction epidemic because you're going to find that you're going to need millions of different solutions because everybody's different. And I I just thought that was really poignant. I thought that was really, really insightful, man. You know, I think that our listeners can uh, gain a lot from this conversation that we're going to have here. Great. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, David. Now, you you are a recovering, you are recovering from addiction, correct? That is correct. Yeah, I spent uh, really uh, 15 plus years of my life, uh, a lot of up and down, back and forth, but most of that time addicted to opiates, primarily heroin. So it's been a journey for me, but I came out the other side and uh, I love sharing my story and uh, encouraging and helping others find hope uh, in their circumstances. I I really do believe there's hope for everyone uh, in addiction. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me here. Oh, of course, man. Uh, We're we're always looking for guests here at the Addictions Podcast. I mean, whether it's to tell a personal story or... um you know, people who are uh, professionals in this kind of field, um, you know, healthcare and uh, recovery and support. And, you know, it's, uh, I try to get as many different viewpoints as possible on these types of subjects, you know, because it's, uh, like you said, you know, it's, there's not a one size fits all solution to this. And I mean, that you could say the same about a lot of things in the criminal justice system, but 
Uh, I think that really fits really well with, with the addictions thing. And I have actually noticed that since, at least with the opioid epidemic, that the uh, heightened awareness that we have about it now, that the the stigma, it's, I guess it's, you know, it's not as bad as it could be, but it it could be a lot better, you know. And, and I'm sure that, you know, in the past, like with the, when we had the big cocaine and crack problems back in the, the 80s and 90s and uh, there was, you know, negative stigma there. There's negative stigma around race and stuff like that. But uh, just you would not believe some of the things that I've heard and read. I mean, I've actually heard people that I know say some really nasty things about uh, people that are dealing with addiction. And it, it just breaks my heart, you know. I mean, where is the empathy? <laughs> it just blows me away. Now, have you ever, I'm sure you've witnessed firsthand this negative stigma regarding addiction. Yeah. Well, I think we do see it all around us. I mean, you mentioned it on your last episode. This is probably where people see it in the most ugly form uh, is in social media and, and in comments. I just ran into one myself the other week where uh, an individual commented that first responders should um, maybe save a life once and then that's it. Let them die. Let the idiots die was the comment. And uh, it's it's not only uh, a lack of education and adding to the stigma around addiction, but uh, it's like you said, it's a lack of, of empathy. And uh, what that does is it, um, it it disconnects these individuals from society. Johan Hari, I think a lot of people have seen his TED talk when he he talks about addiction. He has gone as far as to say the opposite of addiction is connection. Yeah, and I really do agree with him on that in the sense that um, we really we need to find a way to help uh, people struggling with addiction reconnect with society. And when we are throwing unhelpful labels on them or labels that separate them from society as a whole, then it's disconnecting them. And so we're, we're actually contributing to the problem in that sense. Yeah, exactly. So I know a lot of these people that throw out these thoughtless comments or uh, they don't even think that this is a part, they're part of the problem when in fact those comments contribute to the problem. Yeah, they do. That's for sure. And, and I know, I know exactly what, which Ted talk you're talking about. He, it was the one where he, uh, he talked about the the Rat Park experiment, which I, I thought that was just fascinating. I mean, really, really interesting. And if if our listeners, if you haven't seen that TED Talk, it's on YouTube, I believe. Um, it should be easy to find. I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode so that you guys can find that. But definitely a really, really good video and worth watching. I actually learned a lot from that video. And I actually think that he's he's definitely right. Connection is the opposite of addiction. And from my personal experience, you know, once once I got I got onto Suboxone, uh, I was on Suboxone for about a year and uh, tapered off and eventually jumped with eh, minimal withdrawal sim- symptoms. I did have some issues, but nothing that you know I couldn't handle. Good for you because I had a uh, I had the opposite experience with that, but yeah. that's another story. <laughs> Anyways, after after I got through the woods, I mean, I'm still, even now, I'm still experiencing some of the post-acute withdrawal symptoms, uh, you know, the depression and slight anxiety and uh, things like this, uh, and that temptation is always there, but I will say that, you know, since I've started the podcast, uh, I've actually started a few other different uh, media projects that I'm working on besides the addictions show but since I've been doing this, I have been making all of these new connections to people that I, you know, in a million years, I never would have thought that I would be interviewing a guy from Australia or being on another podcast based in the UK or, you know, and and it, it gives you a certain sense of fulfillment, a certain sense of pride. And I feel like that is uh, almost a necessity. Uh, it's it's what we, we long for as humans, you know, uh, that that feeling of being connected to something. Yeah, I do believe that that's hardwired into us, yeah. Definitely, definitely. And just like you said, you know, throwing around these labels and these uh, just terribly derogatory comments and 
even misinformation. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there that, you know, just things that are just completely untrue. That all contributes to this this whole problem in a, in a really big way. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of wondering, you know, besides trying to talk sense into people that we encounter who are perpetuating this negative stigma, uh, you know, what is there that we can do besides join together in groups and stuff like this and talk about it? I mean, you know, there there needs to be some sort of action, some sort of... Uh, I mean, because you can't twist people's arms and force them to go to uh, like a, a re-educational thing, you know. I, uh, it's it's difficult, and I, it's whose job. Where does that responsibility fall? I guess is what I'm trying to figure out. You know, how how do we do this? I think really you can only be responsible for yourself. Yeah. And uh, so for my for myself, the steps I take in kind of reducing stigma is by talking with the people around me. And the way I do it is through uh, using language that is people first. And I really can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to use, really look at the language we use when we talk about addiction. Now, like last episode, you mentioned the word junkie. Um, This kind of stuff, words like that have been in our our vernacular for, for decades and it's starting to change, and we're starting to recognize that the people that use substances are human beings, and uh, they need to be looked at and talked to like they're people first, and their behavior is second. So a really simple thing is maybe instead of saying drug addict, in reference to someone, we could say we're, talk- we're talking to a person with a drug addiction. It's yeah. a slight and simple change, but it makes that, it humanizes the person we're talking about instead of zeroing in on their behavior. Exactly. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense to me. It really does, Daniel. When I was really young, I I mean, I'm talking like eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. I can remember some of the anti-drug commercials on television and one of them was, um, uh, they were, they were showing all these different, this different imagery, you know, and then you hear this little boy's voice, and he says, "When I grow up, I want to be a junkie." You know, and that was like twenty some years ago. Wow. You know, so I mean, compared to now, I don't think you would see a commercial like that on television now. Uh, but that word is definitely thrown a lot, thrown around a lot more than it really should be. But it, anyways, when you when you sent me that message, uh, that kind of. Uh, opened up my uh, perspective on things a little bit more than I previously had thought about it. You know, I I never really thought about how using the term drug addict is kind of, in essence, dehumanizing. I mean, to a degree, it it is. I mean, I think we can also, we got to be cautious. We could probably go overboard with our uh, political correct need to use language that uh, doesn't offend people or add stigma. And I'm not saying that we need to go crazy with making sure every word that comes out of our mouth doesn't have a, a negative implication. But um, there is, here, here's another example for you and one that I've tossed out of my vocabulary. Uh, I would often talk about clean time. Uh, the problem I now have with that is that clean implies the opposite of that is dirty and it's just, it's a negative picture. So that, so now I'm clean. Well, what was I before? Oh, you were dirty before. What does that uh, stir in our thinking? How does it make a person feel about themselves, how they view themselves, their self worth uh, and that sort of thing. So I just tossed those words out. And I now, instead of saying clean, I say free of substances. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a, again, a subtle change but it, it, it's it got major implication. Definitely. You know, and I think um, especially with people that are really fresh and new to getting into recovery from addiction, I think those words and stuff like that are really dangerous. Whereas, say, a person who has been through recovery and they're, you know, it's 10, 15 years down the line, I feel like people who have been sober or clean or free of drugs – for that long, I think they're going to have less of an issue with those those stigmatizing words than a person who is 
maybe only a few months into recovery, you know? Yeah, that, that makes sense. And it's true, but that, uh, you know, that leads me, I want to maybe segue into how we sometimes put these labels on people that are, are really unhelpful. And even, uh, even to the point of self stigmatizing, yeah, which can create feelings of shame and, and guilt on ourselves and um and those you know what those things do guilt and shame they, they really shut us down uh I, they lead back to isolation and and isolation is a dangerous place for someone that's uh, recovering from addiction so you know i think we do need to watch out for unhelpful labels and and this and such so i want to maybe take a bold stance on something such as call even calling myself an addict uh i don't do that anymore now i'm not saying that everyone that's been through addiction should do what i do some people might feel empowered uh by by using that label on themselves and if that's you then you know what go for it but for me i i stopped doing that when i just applied a little bit of logic to to that term you know the 12-step uh model suggest once an addict, always an addict. And uh, I found that perception, I found that to be a hopeless way of thinking for myself. It's kind of like, oh man, if this is, uh, if this is all there is, then uh, how am I, you know, what is the point of anything? And it, it really had me stuck in a funk for a long, a long time until I decided to separate myself from that way of thinking and uh, decide that, hey, I, Labels really are just for jars. They're not for me. Yeah. Uh, Stick a label on a jar. Don't stick a label on me. And, uh, you know, I want to use a real quick analogy. Nicotine is kind of universally accepted as as maybe the hardest substance to quit. For the most part, that's generally agreed upon. And uh, I personally, I've known a lot of people that quit smoking cigarettes. I, I smoked cigarettes for five or six years when I was young, and I did quit as well. And I have never run in in my life run into someone that has quit smoking and years and years later still refers to themselves as a smoking addict or a yeah, addict. yeah that's a really good point so they don't uh, identify that way any longer why don't they identify that way any longer well because it's it's not part of their life that they, they've moved on from that and and i don't want to put out the message of uh, like the dangerous message of complacency that can happen in recovery in which well if you if you're you become complacent you can go back there and i i very much uh, agree that that's a possibility but i also find that those unhelpful labels can keep us trapped into a belief system that's really just not true definitely they definitely can and you know and we see it in the media too i mean it's not I wouldn't say it's saturated in the media. I mean, uh, we can kind of, in a, in a lot of ways, we can thank the media for spreading some of the awareness about the epidemic of the opioids. In the same token, that also kind of, uh, it does perpetuate that negative stigma to a degree in some ways, uh, because it's, I mean, you know, more awareness means more people are going to know about it, you know, and there, there, there are people that are a, a little... Um, ignorant to the subject, you know, and they they don't understand that this is uh, stigmatizing. You know, a lot of them, they they may say these words without even really understanding the damage that they're doing. Yes, absolutely. And you know what? Another area I find that the media is really complicit in contributing to stigma. Uh, Like I live in, uh, well, just in Metro Vancouver area here in BC, Canada. And so the Vancouver downtown East End is pretty well known around the world as being a very small area, massive, massive substance use problems and mental health issues. And uh, when the media prints articles about, say, the opioid crisis or addiction in general, it's like every single time the imagery that accompanies it is from the downtown East End of Vancouver. It, it depicts street entrenched people uh, using substances on the street, homeless, and it's not, it's a stigmatizing view of people who use substances, and it is not even slightly accurate. Exactly. Uh, you know, addiction doesn't discriminate. Uh, whether you're poor or rich, uh, you, you can still become addicted. It's, you know, socioeconomic status has nothing to do with it it's very true i mean 80 percent 
in 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 Canada, eighty percent. Well, I'll, I'll talk about British Columbia where I live. Of the overdose deaths, eighty percent are men who are in houses. They they have a place where they live. They're not out on the street. So if this is the numbers, then why is the imagery? Now, I will give credit to our health authority here uh, who have launched a new anti-stigma campaign. And they've got these posters up on bus stops around town and they've got radio advertising. And uh, just an example of one of the posters is um, a picture of uh, a young lady that looks uh, like she's doing well in life. And the caption simply says, cousin, student, drug user, friend. And they're really trying to paint the picture that people who use drugs are real people. Yeah. They're not just these, they're not what many picture in, your, in their minds when they think about someone who's addicted to drugs. A number of years ago, I was sharing my story publicly and uh, following that, I was approached by a woman who wanted to, I suppose, con- compliment me on my journey into recovery. And what she said to me was, uh, I can't picture you as a, as a drug addict. Those were her exact words. I can't picture you as a drug addict. My initial response was, well, thank you. You know, I mean, I guess she's complimenting me, but in, in reflecting upon that and knowing what I know about stigma now, this is because this woman had a picture in her mind of what a substance user should look like. Exactly. And I didn't fit that picture because I was well dressed and uh looked like I was taking care of myself. Uh I didn't fit the picture in her stigmatized picture of a drug user. And uh that's a problem. And it is changing. You you mentioned that at the beginning and it, it is changing in society. This message is getting out there. It's uh it, it crosses all barriers, doesn't discriminate as you said. You know, but we just need to continue talking about the importance of language. Yes. The importance of inclusion, all people. And uh, not all people that use drugs need to go to treatment either. No, no. I, I, I myself, I mean, I went through the Suboxone program, the replacement therapy stuff, and a little bit of counseling. But, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't involved in any, uh, you know, 12 step programs or anything like that. Um, but I, I, it just, it wasn't for me. You know, I, I had my own strategy and I had a, a solid support group and, and that's, that's what worked for me, you know, but one thing I wanted to say, you were mentioning, um, that there in, uh, Vancouver, uh, they had a, like a anti-stigma campaign going on and that's, uh, such a stark difference between Canada and the U.S. Here, here in the U.S., there's at least as far as I know, you know, there's nothing major going on like that. And I, I really think that the states here we could benefit from from really spreading that word. And you know, I, I wish that uh, eventually that that could actually come to be here in the U.S. Well, good. I think someone needs to take some initiative there and definitely, start it up. Definitely. You know, you're doing your part, David, with uh, this podcast and just sharing this message to, uh, I hope, uh, as many people as possible can hear it because uh, stigma does discriminate and it isolates. And well, I've already mentioned it, but the danger of isolation, this is where people die and uh, is when they die and they die alone. That's something that I'd like to see changed uh, in regard to the opiate crisis is reaching the hidden epidemic, these people that are using substances alone in their houses uh, and they feel too stigmatized to reach out for help. And I, I really, I was one of those people. I, um, I always was housed and, and employed uh, during the years of my addiction. And so services that were offered at street level, such as drop-in centers or shelters and the like, while it's difficult to admit, I, I just saw those services as beneath me. And that, that goes to my ego, but it also goes to um, the stigma that I felt that I would have been associated with if I went to those places. Yeah, and, and that's another, that's the, that's the next thing I wanted to talk about was how this, this negative stigma can actually, uh, it can prevent people from wanting to go get the help that they desperately need. You know, I mean, it's, there's such a shamefulness around it you know you don't want to be labeled as an addict you don't want to be labeled as a junkie or you don't want to feel that shame but you know there's no shame in getting that help there really isn't you know that that shame is an illusion it's it's Mm -hmm. 
you know, you've got to do what you've got to do to get better. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Steps are moving forward to realize that addiction really is and needs to be treated as a health issue and not as a, a moral failing or uh, just someone that does nothing but make bad choices. There's more going on there. Yeah. And if we can get that health message out that this is really truly a health issue, we don't need to separate these people from society. We really shouldn't be criminalizing them. No. But we should be reconnecting them with society. No, you're you're one hundred percent right. And I mean, you know, during my I was I was a everyday drug user for seven years, seven plus years. But I held I held the same job for I've, it's going on ten years now, uh, you know. So it's it's not like I was out on the street, you know. I had a job and everything. I mean, of course, I was spending ninety percent of my paycheck on my drugs after my prescription got cut off. But you know, it's it's not the typical stereotypical picture of a a drug user. It's you find people like this everywhere. Yeah, that's the vast majority of stories, really. I, I can only hope that, you know, the more people that we get involved in, in working to reduce this stigma, the better. And with with time, you know, I, I think that, you know, that it will get better. Uh, you know, I, I do have high hopes. But with that, I really appreciate you coming on the, on the Addictions podcast. And in the future, if you're interested, I'd love to have you come on the show and uh, actually run us through your personal story, if if you wouldn't mind. Oh, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I'd tell you a little bit of, of my journey. That would be fantastic. So let's talk again about that, David. Awesome. So- sounds great. Well, those were some pretty insightful conversations. I actually learned a lot, especially when I was speaking with Daniel. I really didn't think about how the language that we use sometimes, without even really realizing it, how harmful that really can be. Even the term addict it can be a word that can trigger people, although it does kind of depend on what context that word is used in. But I think in general, when we're talking about people who have dealt with addiction, that is basically how we should address it. This is a person who has issues or problems with addiction or substance abuse or, you know, things like that. We should try to avoid these words that slap labels on people because, like Daniel said, labels are for jars and we are not jars, that's for sure. As always, I want to thank you all so very much for listening to this episode of Addictions. I'm David Wagner, and remember, never quit quitting. You spent your own money freely, then you smashed your own car. You aren't what you are really, you missed it by so damn far. Your head feels like it's in a blender. And you hate to see the dawn Your stomach says return to sender After the buzz is gone And Sundays you prayed Uncle John You poisoned yourself last night Mary slapped your friend Tom You got in a hell of a Seems so damn long The weekend's past You're still a jerk After the buzz is gone